You're listening to the Mommy Labor Nurse Podcast, episode number 61. Hey guys, welcome back. Happy Monday. We have a cool episode this week uh, that is on the podcast. This one is a little bit different. It's not a birth story. It's not an expert interview and it's not a Q&A. I'm not sure what category it fits into. Maybe it's an expert interview maybe it's an expert interview. <laughs> but this episode is all about nursing, L&D nursing. So this week I had my friend slash employee slash she's involved in a lot of other parts of my life. <laughs> my friend Tiffany come on and we chatted all about labor and delivery nursing because we are both labor and delivery nurses at the same hospital and we have been for about the same time. So we decided to do this episode because we get a fair amount of DMs from you guys who are nurses or interested in nursing, interested in L&D nursing and want to know the process and just just have questions and thoughts about what it's like to be a labor and delivery nurse and how we, you know, what my journey was, how I got into labor and delivery nursing. So we went into that in this episode and it was just it was just fun to sit down with Tiffany and talk about these sorts of things. So yeah, we both talked about our individual journeys to labor and delivery and how we started out, how what our schoolings were like. We talked about a typical day on the floor and what we liked most about labor and delivery, what we liked what we liked least about labor and delivery, and then also just some tips and tricks for new grads or people who are interested in getting into labor and delivery. So it was a pretty cool episode. Um, I get along really well with Tiffany, and it's just you know we know each other very well, so we so the conversation was very easy. <laughs> so. Without further ado, let's get into this week's episode all about labor and delivery nursing. You're listening to the Mommy Labor Nurse Podcast, where we firmly believe in the power of education when it comes to giving birth. Tune in each week as we dive into pregnancy-related topics, expert interviews, and a variety of birth stories. As a reminder, anything you hear on this podcast is not medical advice. Please see mommylabornurse.com slash disclaimer for more details. And now, here's your host, educator, registered nurse, and fellow mom, Liesl Teen. This episode of the Mommy Labor Nurse Podcast was brought to you by Willow. Can you hear it? I'm actually pumping with the willow right now. (laughs) It is no secret that I am in love with my willow pump. It is definitely the pump that I use the most out of all of my pumps. I have my share of pumps. And you guys know that I do pump reviews on my Instagram page. Willow was the very first pump that I reviewed. And I got to say, it's definitely the one, like I said, that I go to the most. Willow is on a mission to modernize motherhood. The Willow Pump is the world's first all-in-one wearable breast pump that fits into your bra, giving you the freedom to pump wherever life takes you. Everything you need to pump is inside with no cords, long tubes, or dangling bottles to hold you back. Thanks to their no-spill technology, Willow is the only wearable breast pump that can be used in any position without milk leaking. It's true. You can do cartwheels. I promise. I said earlier in my, I think in one of my reviews that I couldn't do a cartwheel, but if you have it on with the bags, you can do a cartwheel and there's no leaking. (laughs) With only four parts to assemble and just two to clean, plus an app that tracks your volume in real time, that is, uh, might be my favorite part. (laughs) You can build your life around your purpose and passion, not your pumping schedule. And since this episode is all about nursing, I figured this was a good one. This was a good sponsor to put in uh, because I know a lot of nurses that use the willow and they love the willow because the willow is all about movement and doing things uh, at the same time that you're pumping. And nursing is that kind of career that you're allowed pump breaks, but sometimes you have to multitask. (laughs) So that's why I know a lot of nurses love their willow pumps and use the willow pump. I've used it at my hospital shifts um, a fair amount and absolutely recommend it whenever somebody DMs me asking about a pump to get who is a nurse. I always say go with the willow. So yeah, head over to mommylabornurse.com slash willow and get you a willow if you are a nurse or if you're not a nurse and you're just interested in getting one. 
Like I said, I also have a nice review that I gave of my Willow Pump on my Instagram page under my highlights that you can check out if you want the full review and to see, you know, kind of what it looks like and me with my hands on it as well. So head over there to my highlights or go to mommylabornurse.com slash Willow. And now let's get into today's episode. Hi, Tiffany. Welcome to the Mommy Labor Nurse Podcast again. Thank you so much for being here tonight at 8.44 p.m. after our children are in bed. (laughs) After we've been playing with podcast stuff for an hour, it seems like, together. So, Tiffany, I think most people know who you are. Um, So I think this is probably the last time that we have to do this, but can you just tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and where you're from and what you do and all that good stuff? Yeah. So my name is Tiffany. I've been on the Mommy Labor Nurse podcast um, a handful of times. This is like the fourth or fifth time, but I'm a labor and delivery nurse. I work at the same hospital as Liesl. Uh, Liesl and I are also really good friends with each other. With each other, We've known each other for years and years and years. Um, and I have two little boys at home. I have a ooh, 20-month-old and an eight-month-old. Woohoo! Very Easy. <laughs> And busy, yes. Busy, busy. All right, guys. Well, we are doing a cool episode this week since Tiffany and I both work at the same hospital and we're both labor and delivery nurses. We thought it would be cool to do an episode all about labor and delivery, nursing, uh, what to expect, you know, on the floor, or if you're just interested in becoming a labor and delivery nurse, we get a handful of questions like this. And I would say we have a like a good amount of just nurses that follow on Instagram um, and ask these sorts of questions. You know, I'm, I, I work in med surge or I work somewhere else and I'm interested in getting into labor and delivery and, you know, asking some questions. So we figured this would be a good a cool episode. So we have just a few questions that we're just going to kind of go back and forth and go through. So Tiffany, you want to kick off the first one? Yeah. So first off, we're going to talk about how you even become a nurse. So Liesl, tell us a little bit about the schooling that was required to you even getting to the point of becoming a registered nurse. Yeah. So me personally, I'll talk about just there, there's a few different ways to do it. Okay. And how I know it is you have to either go to a four year university, you know, a UNC, a UNC or UN, I, your UNCW or, you know, a four year a bachelor program, a nursing bachelor program, um, and get your degree that way. And then when you graduate, you'll have a bachelor's of science in nursing, and then you can take the NCLEX and, become a registered nurse that way. So that's one path that you can take. Another path is you can go to a community college, do some prereqs at your community college for their nursing program, and then get what's called um, an associate. I forgot what the A was, (laughs) what the A stood for. And that is an associate's degree, you know, in nursing, but you can still sit for the same license. So after you get finished with that program, it's usually a two-year program. After you get finished with that program, you can sit and take the NCLEX and get the same license that somebody could get after having, after going through a four-year bachelor degree program. You just don't have a bachelor's degree. You have an associate's degree, but you still are an RN. You still have an RN license, if that makes sense. So those are the two ways. And then I know that there is, there are do they even still exist like a diploma program that you can go through? Are you familiar with that at all? That you can go through like a hospital program? I think, I think, I think that they still exist. Yeah. I know it's not as common and popular, but um, I think that they still do. Yeah. 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 So I think that's another way to do it. And that I think is three, somewhere around three years. Um, so those are generally kind of the the choices you have. Now, it depends on the state that you live in. So I know down here in North Carolina, just where we are, there are a handful of community colleges and a handful of um, four-year universities. So you kind of have a choice and you can still get hired at most hospitals still with just getting your ADN. Um, 
but sometimes you have to sign like per- personally that's what I did I went to a community college and I got my associate's degree and then I went back and I got my bachelor's degree after I already started working a lot of times with the hospitals around here you have to you know they'll say okay we'll hire you but you have to get your bachelor's degree within 5 years of getting hired and that's just what the hospital that's what the hospital that I work at they that's what they had me sign. Um, and that's, I would say, fairly popular. Now, in different states, it might be different. So I know, like, I've talked to nurses who live in um, some of, like, the northern states, like in New Jersey. I know it's not, like, most of those, uh, the, like, most of those states up there, they don't have a lot of community college op- options. So your only option is to have, like, to go to a four-year university or like if you're thinking, okay, let's say I didn't have my BSN yet and I just had my ADN and I was getting ready to move up to, you know, New Jersey, let's say, um, I might have some issue. I might have some trouble getting a job because they only hire uh, BSN nurses. That's how I know it. Um, (laughs) Tiffany, if you have anything to add to that, uh, you can, but that's that's how I know it. I know nothing about (laughs) painting a nursing degree in any other state outside of North Carolina. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I could be completely wrong, but that's just what someone told me that I used to work with at my old job. She, she it was from New Jersey and she told that, told me that. And so, I mean, I, of course I could be completely wrong. I guess we probably should have looked it up before this episode, but you know, it is what it is. <laughs> yeah. What I talked about is like the, the three ways how you get there are yeah. pretty standard in the United States. And then obviously yeah. if you're listening somewhere outside of the United States, things are a little bit different, but yeah. generally, yes, you can either go through a diploma route. You can go and get your associate's degree in nursing, or you can go and get your bachelor's in nursing. Yeah. So let's talk about our individual, what, what we both did. I kind of touched on mine a little bit. Um, but personally, what I did is I went to a community college, got my ADN through there. And then I started working at the hospital that, I, or actually it was a different hospital, but I started working as an RN, took the NCLEX, started working just with an associate's degree, um, and then went back to school, did an online uh, schooling to get my bachelor's degree. And I have a BSN now, um, but I didn't go to like a four-year university to get that. Or I did, you know, through my online, but like I I went the ADN route first because it's honestly, I did that because it was the cheaper route <laughs> and it took a little bit less time and I could get out and work a little bit sooner. So that's just personally what I did. Um, Tiffany, what did you do? Yep. So when I graduated from high school, I went to NC State Um, and I actually got a bachelor's degree in biology at NC state. I kind of toyed between going to med school and going to nursing school. And I decided to just stick with non-nursing and NC state didn't offer a nursing program either. So it wasn't an option. I would have had to transfer. Um, so I got my bachelor's in biology and then that was in 2008 and the job market was just horrifying in 2008, Mm -hmm. um, a job. And I then decided to go back to nursing school. So I got my associate's degree also in nursing at Wake Tech, which is a community college in Raleigh. Um, So that took me a little less than two years to do. Um, I think it was like 20 months maybe. And then after that, yeah, I got a job and then I went and got my bachelor's degree in nursing through the University of North Carolina at Wilmington, just an online program. Um, also, that took about a year to do that. And then, yep, that wound me to where I am. Yeah, yeah, same. We went to the same, we did the same online schooling. It just took me a little bit longer than a year because <laughs> I had a baby and I just don't like school. (laughs) So it just took me a little bit longer than a year to get that done. Um, So as far as L&D, though, Tiffany, where did you work? Because you didn't start out in L&D and neither did I. So where did you start out before you transferred to L&D? So I started out in a med surge setting at the hospital that I work at, but a different campus. Mm -hmm. And I think when I graduated from nursing school, the job market was still really crappy. Um, I think I had like three interviews and I only got one of those jobs. So I, I didn't 
have any choice. I mean, it was just, I applied to like 300 jobs and just got a couple of interviews and then got this one job. Um, so yeah, we did a lot of, um, surgical, you know, post-op surgery for all different patient populations, lots of oncology up there. It was like a total mishmash of, of stuff. Um, so I did that for about three years and then I moved into labor and delivery, which I had always wanted to get into. You know, when I said earlier that I was thinking about med school, it was always with the intention that I would go and be an OBGYN. That was always my intention. If I chose the med school path, I just didn't end up choosing that. So I always knew I wanted to get into labor and delivery. Um, and I didn't really try before those three years, like I, you know, I did my time. I did my due diligence in med surge. I'm really glad that I had that opportunity. I learned a lot. I really learned about, you know, just assessing patients and multitasking and how to work with the, you know, interdisciplinary team and like all those things that are really, really important. Um, and then, yeah, I happened to just like, there was a job posted um, at our hospital for labor and delivery. And I was just over the med surge stuff. And I was applying to a lot of different things. I always wanted it to be labor and delivery, but thought like, I really don't care where I go now. Like maybe I'll go to ICU. Maybe I'll go to the NICU. I really don't care. I just need to get out of this particular setting. (laughs) But I, but like, obviously labor and delivery was like the top, top choice. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I just randomly applied for a job and was shocked when I got an email or a phone call. I can't remember from our manager asking if I wanted to come in and shadow. Um, And at this point, Liesl, you were actually working for the hospital already in labor and delivery. So you started in L and D like five or six months, probably before I did. And we, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, actually, that I didn't even use you as like a networking tool to try and get a job because I'm stubborn and I like to do things myself (laughs) and I don't like to feel like I'm handed things in life, which is really, really dumb. Like it's really dumb and, and stupid, but yeah, you were working there and I didn't even like utilize like what would have been my best source to try and get a job. I wanted to do it myself. Yeah. Yeah. And we're going to talk about this more and later on in the podcast of like things that you can do if you're interested to get into LED. And I highly recommend not doing what I did. You use your resources (laughs) and you network as much as you possibly can. Don't do what I did. (laughs) But it worked out and I, you know, I got to where I wanted to be. So that's all that really matters. Yeah, that's cool. I know that is so funny. So I started in L&D in August. And when, what month did you start? April, I think. Okay. So it was, it was, it was a little bit longer than it was like eight, I guess, months, something like that. Yeah. Cause I remember it was, it was in, yeah, you're right. It was springtime. I just remember it was, you know what I remember? Uh, when you started, you started the first day that you started, they were moving stuff to the new floor. Remember? And you remember mm-hmm. you were like moving, you were like helping move like chairs and stuff. Oh, I just remember. Yeah, like, very I did like nothing. That. <laughs> yeah, I did nothing labor and delivery yeah, related like that day. moving furniture. <laughs> yeah, we were, we had like opened up our brand new labor and delivery wing and yeah. I started on that day. So I was helping, <laughs> yeah, move stuff. It we're was a weird day. Nursing. Yeah, you yeah. weren't even like doing patient care. Yeah, that's so funny. Yeah, so me personally, how I got into labor and delivery, I, um, like I said, you know, graduated with my ADN and got, uh, and took the N class and, and, got my RN. And then kind of the same situation where there wasn't a whole lot of jobs available and I had troubles. I had trouble getting interviews. Um, I can't even remember how many. I I think I had two maybe or maybe three. I don't remember. But I actually went to like a job fair um, in Harnett County (laughs) and got a job at the hospital down there uh, in the emergency department because it was, it was just, I mean, it was like one of those little job fairs that you go to and they had like open interviews and I was able to sit for an interview and they hired me on the spot because it was a new hospital that they were, 
that they had just opened like six months ago or something and they needed nurses um, in the emergency department. And I said, okay, yeah, I mean, that sounds a little bit more ideal in terms, I, I was the same way. I always wanted, to, I always knew I wanted to go into labor and delivery. So I was just trying to get some experience um, before I could get a job in L&D, which I guess we'll talk about it later too. Um, we'll touch on, probably touch on it later too, but that's not, I mean, a lot of hospitals are like that where you need some experience before you transfer into L&D because it is a specialty, but there are new grad options for, at least at the hospital that we work at, there are some new grad positions that they fill. If somebody's just graduating from nursing school, they can get right into L&D, but they're few and far between. So I knew that, that I wanted to eventually work into labor and delivery and wanted to you know, get my, get my experience before I transferred over there. So yeah, worked in the emergency department down there at a different hospital. This was not the hospital that we, that we both work at now. It was this new hospital, um, got my, got about a year of experience and same, I feel the exact same way about that experience that you did. I, I got lots of skills. I saw lots of different kinds of patients. I learned to manage my time effectively. Like it was, it was really, really good and, um, a good first year of nursing, I would say. Uh, but once, um, once I was able to transfer out, I, I did, I actually, I had a, it was funny cause I had a contact. Um, it was like a friend of a friend that I met uh, like a year or two before. I even was a nurse and got her contact information and got my manager's contact information from her. So that whole first year of me being an RN, like I was sending our manager emails, like, like quarterly emails, like, Hey, my name is uh, Liesl. This is, you know, I got your email from so-and-so. I'm really interested in working for you. I'm really eager. I love labor and delivery. And, you know, she, our manager's like super, super crazy nice. And she was like, Oh yeah, you know, that sounds great. I'd love to interview you, but you know, we, we just, you just need to get a year of experience first. So, um, yeah, I kind of just sent her an email every three months of like, Hey, don't forget about me. Still really, really interested. Um, you know, I'll contact you when I was just, you know, annoying, but, but eagerly annoying, (laughs) which is sometimes, which is usually good if you're trying to get a job. Um, so yeah, after that year, I, I sent her another email and she was like, oh yeah, we are hiring, uh, you know, click on this link and put your information here and we'll get you in an interview. And I did. And then a couple of days later, yeah, I was able to, to get a job. So yeah, so that's, that's us. I guess that was kind of a long answer to that first question. Um, but let's talk about, let's talk about competency, comp, competent. Wow. I can't say that word competencies <laughs> that you have to keep up if you are a labor and delivery nurse. Um, specifically, I guess, I think, Tiffany, you should touch on the stuff that we have to do every every year, every couple of years, and then talk about your, because Tiffany is an RNC and I'm not an RNC. <laughs> so talk about that as well. Yeah. So just as a nurse in general, you have to Uh, maintain your license, which we do that every two years. Um, And it's essentially just kind of depending on how you practice with your RN license and what you have to do in order to maintain it. So that's kind of the first thing that you have to do as um, if you work in the hospital full time, I think you have to do 15 hours of continuing ed uh, every two years. And then, like I said, just depending on whether you're part-time or if you're supplemental um, or if you're not even working at the bedside, if you're doing something else, it kind of varies. So that's the first thing that you have to do. As far as labor and delivery stuff goes, um, we do advanced fetal monitoring every two years where we have to go sit in a classroom for eight hours and go through fetal monitoring. And it's essentially just like learning about any new updates as far as like looking at the monitor to determine baby's, you know, baseline heart rate and Mm -hmm. variability and, you know, all these kinds of things. So we have to do that every two years. Um, Every year we have to, this is a hospital thing. And I think a lot of hospitals are moving to this kind of, you know, thing, but it's called our Donna Wright competencies. And that has to do with 
things that we determine on our unit that we need more education about. Um, so this year, a couple of the things that we're doing are like one of them is um, specific to postpartum hemorrhages and collecting blood gases from the umbilical cord. We're doing one on bedside reporting. So just, you know, a couple of things, there's usually like five to eight of them. Um, so we do that once a year. And then we do neonatal resuscitation. So that is every two years that we have to do that. Um, and that is essentially like a quick little, you know, online thing that you do. And then we have to go into a sim lab and resuscitate, you know, little mannequin babies. Um, so there's that. We do uh, basic life support every two years. That's another nursing thing that we do that all nurses have to do if you're working at the bedside. Um, so that's just kind of basic CPR um, and AED use. And then uh, labor and delivery nurses, at least at our hospital, have to be ACLS certified also. So that is like another extension of BLS. Um, it gets a little bit more in depth into reading um, heart rate tracings and like administering meds in the case of abnormal heart rate tracings. So once again, nothing specifically labor and delivery related, it's more of adult ACLS that we have to uh, maintain. And the primary reason that we have to maintain that is because we um, circulate in the OR as labor and delivery nurses. And more importantly, we recover all of our C-section cases. So that is the particular part that makes us needing to keep up our ACLS. Um, so I think that's, can you think of anything else of like that? No, I was trying to think while you were talking. So when I, um, I don't, th I don't think, I know, I know we don't need PALS, but I needed PALS when I worked in the emergency department and then it expired. Yeah. Um, and PALS is just like ACLS, Pediatric Advanced Life Support. Is that what it be? P-A-L-S. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's just the pediatric. Kid. Yeah. It's just the pediatric version of ACLS. Um, so I don't think um, most labor and delivery you, most labor and delivery units would need that, but that is just one of the other things that I'm thinking of, like possibly maybe if you, I would think maybe, maybe you would need PALS if you worked in a unit that was more of like an LDRP NICU, like you, like it has some hospitals that you, you just kind of float around everywhere. <laughs> so yeah. maybe you would need something like that in that regard. But yeah, I would, I, I think you hit it on I, I think you hit everything. Yeah. License. So that's like the, uh, yeah, I'm trying to think <laughs> that's the stuff that like all nurses in labor and delivery have to do. Yeah. Um, and then, yep. Like Liesl said earlier, I have my RNC in obstetric nursing. So that is just an extra certification that you can get. And they have certifications in like every field of nursing. Um, so I got mine in obstetrics. You can also get one as a labor and delivery nurse in fetal monitoring also. And wow. it's just, you know, know that. Yeah. yeah, it's Didn't interesting. It's I've heard that it's not the easiest thing to do oh, and I'm most sure fun not. thing to do. So most sure of us decide to just go the obstetric part, um, but it's very similar to just it's like taking the NCLEX essentially, except every single question is specifically related to a labor and delivery. Um, so I did that two or three years after I started working as a labor and delivery nurse. They, you know, expect you to kind of give your time and make sure that you're really proficient in what you're doing. And then you take that test. Um, so I did that. And for that, I maintain that certification. Uh, every three years, I have to renew it. And there is same thing, continuing education that you have to do surrounding that. And the reason that I chose to do that for myself is our hospital has a progression ladder that you can move up. Essentially, if you do things, kind of extracurricular activities, I would call them, um, outside of just like working your 12-hour shift, then you can get paid more. And mm -hmm. the certification is one of those things that that's a piece of it that you can get paid more if you do that. So that's primarily the reason why I did it. You did it for the money. I did it for the money. <laughs> but it is kind of fun to, you know, tell people that I've got my, yeah. you know, I'm a BSN 
you know, comma yeah. R N C O B. So that's kind of yeah. fun. Yeah, no, that's I'm reading your little signature right now. That's what it says. So no, I don't I don't have it. So um and I've I've I mean, I think it's I think as I put it on my goals for every year to <laughs> to do like when I'm doing annual reviews, my man my manager's like, What are you gonna do this year, Lisa? I'm like, I'm gonna get my R N C and then I it's December don't. and I'm like, crap. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't I haven't done it. Um but again, I said this before and I'll say it again. I, I hate school. I just, I'm just one of those that I just, I hate studying for stuff. I just get nervous with tests and ugh, I hate it. So I avoid, I, I avoid that if I can, but I would really like to get it because I think it's, I think it would give, um, I, I, I mean, do you feel like you, do you feel like you actually learned a whole lot when you were studying for that? No. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, well, maybe it's so, not worth it. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I think the thing with that is we, the hospital that Liesl and I work at is a high risk hospital. Yeah. We take care of all kinds of patients. We don't send patients out at all unless like baby is going to require some kind of surgery or care after delivery that our hospital cannot handle. So mm-hmm. that happens like rarely. I've seen that happen. A ha- I could count on my like one Same. hand, yeah. you know, the number of times I've seen that happen. So because of that, like it wasn't a hard test. It wasn't yeah. something that I had to study a ton for just because I see so much, but I would imagine somebody that works as a labor and delivery nurse, who's not taking care of as like high risk of a population as we do. Yeah. Maybe would have gotten more out of it, but for me, it wasn't like, I, I kind of knew a lot of what they were doing. So I hate yeah. to say that the only reason I did it was for the money, but like, truthfully, that was the only reason, but also, driving force. <laughs> I mean, yeah, like what I do, I, that being one piece of everything that I do, cause I'm involved in committees on the, at the hospital and I try to help out in, you know, different ways. I mean, yeah. I, I probably, it's like an extra three fifty an hour, probably, yeah. I think. So it's, it's not, it's not <laughs> nothing. Yeah, yeah. It's not nothing. Yeah. No, that's a lot, especially if you work, you know, if you work full time. Yeah. That's, that's definitely a lot. Yeah. Um, I had a side question before you go, uh, before you ask the next one um, that I thought of, cause you mentioned the next, the NCLEX. So how many, I'll tell mine, how many questions did, do you remember how, what question your NCLEX stopped at? Whatever the least was. Is it 75? Okay. Whatever okay. the least yeah, yeah, yeah. was. That's what, what mine was. Yeah. That's what mine was too. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Side note. If you're a nurse and you take in the NCLEX you know or, yeah. or you're, if, if you're about to take the NCLEX and you're in nursing school, you know that it's like this, the NCLEX. Yeah, 75 to it, 250 or something yes, like that. And it's this weird like thing. It's this weird thing that they do where you go in and you, you know, it's on a computer, multiple choice questions, and you go in and you have to at least answer 75 of them, but you can get anywhere to, I think you said it's 250 or 225 something or something like that. Like Somewhere that. High, yeah. In the 200s. Yeah. So it's like, and it'll cut you off at some point, whether once it knows that you've like passed a certain percentage or like failed a certain percentage. So it's really nerve wracking because like, you could get to 75 and it turns off on you and you could totally have like flunked the whole thing at that point because like you didn't, you didn't get like 60% right or something. I, that's a random percentage, but it's like this weird thing where, okay, some people will turn off at a hundred questions because now you've passed enough where you um, where they know that you've at least passed the test and it, they don't, ha- it, it's so, it's so, so weird. But if you know what we're talking about, <laughs> you, un- you understand, but if this is like, if you're not a nurse, we're, we're speaking a different language, but I was just curious what, what number, <laughs> what, what number you, uh, topped yeah. out at. Yeah. I was the same way. 75. I was 75 I was and I was pretty, out. yeah, I was like pretty confident that I passed because yeah. there's also something where, they say if the last few questions that you have, if you're pretty confident that like you got those correct, then you probably pass the test. So hmm. I remember I that. that. Yeah, I remember that. That like if you 
the last five or six questions, if you like, feel like you got them correct, then you probably passed. But yeah, it's nerve wracking though. I, again, I hate school. I don't, I'm like, I, I, I think I still have, I'm, I'm one of those that I have like those dreams where I'm in school and I have like a project due and I haven't done any part of the project and I'm like freaking out, you know, the, like those scary dreams. I just am not a school person. Well, so I, I guess that never, kind of goes ever. into, we were going to talk about this later on, but maybe yeah. we should talk about it now. Is yeah. that a solid no that you're never going to like go back to school oh. and advance your career in any way? <laughs> yeah. So that was a question. So I no, I mean, probably if I really like, if I'm really like, oh, this, this sounds like something that I want to really tackle on. And I, I was, I was actually talking to one of the nurses when I was working this past week and I was talking about it to one of the other nurses. Um, cause a lot of the nurses that we work with are in school, um, for, to get their either nurse practitioner, most of them are in nurse practitioner school. Um, and I'm like, Oh, I, I'm, I've never, that sounds horrible to me. I was like, I think the only thing that I would go back is maybe go to like midwifery school, but around here, but I would just get it for like the education. Like, I don't know that I would ever want to work as a midwife because there, I, I don't know that I could like do 24 hour calls that they, you know, it's like the hours are weird. And I, I think, I think the only reason I would ever do that is just to like get the education like the knowledge aspect. Like, I don't know that I would advance my career to like advance my career and like start working as a midwife. So yeah, that's my answer to that. What about you? <laughs> um, Yeah, no, I think I'm a solid no to ever going back to school. Also, <laughs> yeah. I always thought that I would, like when I worked yeah. med surge, I thought I, for did sure too. That I would go back. Um, yeah. And I thought I would, I would go back to get my FMP or, you know, my women's health nurse practitioner stuff. Um, and then I moved to labor and delivery and I love labor and delivery. Like I don't, it's not even just a love, like you and I both are just so, so passionate about this field. And I just am not convinced that any other area of nursing would ever compare. Um, so that's really my primary reason, you know, what I love to go back to school to like make more money and to maybe not have to do 12 hour shifts and to have a little bit more of a traditional kind of work schedule. Like a lot of those things do sound appealing. Um, but I would only want to do it if I could still deliver babies and like be with, you know, women when they're having their babies and we've yet to find outside of midwifery, I've yet to find anything that, that, would do that for me. And at our hospital, we do utilize midwives. Um, but I think there's just one midwife working at our hospital now and she works in our obstetric emergency department. Um, and occasionally she'll like deliver a baby back there if somebody comes in and has a baby precipitously. But for the most part, they're just triaging patients that come in and whatnot. And I would love to do that kind of job, but mm-hmm. that kind of job is really, really, really hard to come by. Um, yeah. And because of that, yeah, that's really my main reason why I don't think I'll ever go back unless like, yeah, I just all of a sudden hate labor and delivery and don't want to do this anymore. I don't think I'll ever go back to school. Same, same. Yeah, I don't think. Yeah, I'm trying to think of the nurses that we work with. A handful of them have done that where they get their, uh, if they go back to school and become nurse practitioners and the majority of them aren't working in an OB setting anymore. Some of them are, but a, a lot of them just, you know, basically got it so they could advance their career and get a, you know, a higher paying job in a different setting. Um, so yeah, I think like us being the same in terms of like, we want to stay in labor and delivery as much as possible. Like I don't, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't, I I don't think I'm ever gonna, ever gonna do that, do it. Um, all right. So the next question, you asked me this one, I'll go over the, uh, a typical day. <laughs> yeah. So tell me about a typical day on the floor as a labor and delivery nurse. Yeah. So I've written a blog post on this. It's on my website. Um, but 
yeah, I currently work day shift. So a typical day, I'll come in, clock in, we change uh, into like OR scrubs. So you get there a few minutes before, um, like, you know, you get there at 640 or 645 and change into OR scrubs and head up to the floor and get your assignment. And it kind of depends on uh, what day it is and what's going on. Our manager, what she does, or one of our supervisors, what she does is she um, just kind of assigns us to different uh, areas on our unit. So there's a couple different, and we'll talk about this too later, the different areas, but let's say I'm just on the floor and I, you know, just have a, just have a laboring patient. Um, I would go up and look and see what my assignment is and, um, get report from the off from the night nurse. And we usually do bedside report. So I would go into the patient's room. We would talk about all of her health history and what's going, you know, if she's, if she, if she's like in right about to spit a baby out, then we kind of expedite the process. <laughs> um, but we do bedside report and talk about health history and what went on during that shift and, you know, some things that I need to know about the oncoming shift and what's going on with her currently. So I get her report. And then, like I said, depending on what's going on, if she's about to spit a baby out, then we prep for delivery and we have her spit a baby out. Um, But if she's just laboring or she's got an epidural and she's just, you know, just chilling, then I would do an assessment on her, do a full body assessment. Um, I would answer any questions that she has about usually, this has been my experience usually when I come on and it's a new nurse, they usually they usually have a handful of of questions that that um that they you know just cuz i'm a new face <laughs> they want to ask me some 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 questions so i answer any questions that she has about what's going on and then yeah i just kind of run my day i mean it it i'm trying to think of like a certain situation so like if she is let's say she is in, I get her and she's like, she just got admitted from triage and she's like three or four centimeters. She wants an epidural and, you know, she's huffing and puffing, like wants, wants an epidural. So I would get report from the nurse, do an assessment on her and then get everything I needed for the epidural, hang some fluid on her, call anesthesia, have them come up and get her an epidural get her stable after that and um, flip her around a few times. <laughs> and I'm trying to think of like other stuff that we do <laughs> with epidural patients. Um, and then eventually you set up your delivery tray and she has a baby and we recover them for two hours. Then they go over to postpartum and then you get another patient and you do the same thing all over again. <laughs> and that's it. That's that's a wrap. That's, that's what we do all, all day long. I mean, I'm, there's, I'm trying to like, there's so many different, uh, circumstances and like different kinds of patients. So it's like hard to say, oh, yeah. like this is a typical situation because like it, it is like so, so different every single time I come into work because it just, I have a different kind of patient and different kind of situation every single day. But yeah, usually that's what we do is you have your one patient. It's usually one to one unless you're working on a different unit or unless it's like super crazy busy and you have low risk patients and they double you up with with a, you know, with two patients, but it's usually one to one and we'll labor that patient until they deliver or if they have a C-section, we'll scrub, you know, not scrub, we'll you know, circulate them in the OR and recover them. Um, and then once you turn them over to postpartum, then, you know, what's up next? Uh, who's, who's coming up next? I, then I'm, you, you know, you're up next and you get another patient and you just do the same thing all over again until it's 7 PM and you clock out. Um, so yeah. Yeah. I'm sure you have stuff yeah. to add to that, Tiffany. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think the main things I would add are, at our particular hospital, we don't really utilize um, CNAs. So we do yeah. all of the like kind of typical CNA work. We do that ourselves. So we're getting our own vital signs. And if, you know, mom needs to go to the bathroom, we're the ones helping with that. Um, we have surgical techs on the floor that function in the role as a surgical tech and also a secretary and also kind of a floor tech. And they help us with things like, you know, 
it's delivery time and they'll come in during the delivery to hand the doctor a suture, for example, or if they needed to be a runner to go get something. So that's one kind of different thing about labor and delivery um, Mm -hmm. is that it's, it's really just us. It's kind of a one-on-one thing, just the nurse and the patient. The other thing I would say is each hospital is different. And the way that we're talking about how our particular hospital is set up is not always the case. So smaller hospitals um, sometimes we'll utilize it. It's called an LDRP, um, setup where essentially the nurse is labor and delivery and she's also recovery and she's also postpartum. So mm-hmm. at our hospital, we have a separate labor and delivery unit and then a separate postpartum unit. So as a labor and delivery nurse, we do the labor, we do the delivery, we do about two hours of a recovery period after delivery, and then we then hand that patient over to a postpartum nurse. There are some nurses that don't hand them over, they just keep them. Um, So that's one thing that our hospital is a little bit different. And like I said, the big reason for that is we're just a bigger hospital. Um, I think we do like anywhere from five to 6,000 deliveries a year. Um, and then like Liesl said, generally we're one-to-one with our patients. Um, I know that's not standard at all hospitals either. So some hospitals, it is more common that you have two patients, um, in labor. Um, but yeah, we're super blessed to be someplace that usually we have enough nurses around that we're able to be one-to-one. Um, and then gosh, like breaks, let's talk about breaks. So we, we get a lunch break that's 30 minutes long that's and it. <laughs> that, yeah, that can like happen at 1130 or it can happen at 5 PM or it can happen never. I mean, yeah. it doesn't, it's not often that I don't eat, but there are, there have been days for sure where it's like so crazy and I just don't eat. Um, yeah. But yeah, usually we're eating later on in the day. It's very much based on what's going on with your patient. Um, Like I'm not going to leave my patient if she's about to have a baby. And then I'm also not going to leave her to go eat lunch if she just had a baby and is in like that first hour recovery period. So we have to be really good about time management and kind of watching the clock and making sure that we're taking care of ourselves in like it's, it's always about mom and like what she's doing and what she's got going on. And my whole entire day is completely dictated really about where we're at in labor with the particular patient that I'm assigned to that day. Yeah, no, that's a good point. And I was just, I was going to add to that too. So this, I just worked this weekend um, with pumping and stuff. Uh, So, you know, you're obviously like allowed to take breaks to pump. Um, but you just have to find somebody to cover, to, to watch your patient while you go pump. Um, but the nice thing is I have one of those willow pumps and I can just put my willow pump on. That's what I did this weekend. I had my will, my willow pump and I was still in my patient's room supporting her in labor and I was pumping at the same time. So side promo for willow. I love the willow pump and I use it at the hospital all the time for my shifts. So yeah, but in terms of breaks, I think you're right. Um, there are definitely, I mean, like over the weekend, I think I ate at like 4.30 PM. Like I ate my lunch at 4.30 PM some days. It's just, you know, you, you, eat a little cracker, <laughs> eat a, eat a cracker and a peanut butter, um, to hold yeah. you over until you're, <laughs> until you turn over and then you can have a nut. Cause like, I, I agree that I'm in the same way. I don't want to like stop and possibly miss my patient's delivery or even I hate leaving in that tw- two hour recovery time. Like I know some people are like, okay, she delivered and now I can go eat lunch. Can somebody watch my patient? But like, I don't even like to leave. I don't know if you're the same way, but I like, I don't like to leave in that too. Like I would rather just turn my patient over. I don't have a patient. I have to give anybody yeah. report and just like turn her over and then I can like take my lunch afterwards. <laughs> so yeah, yeah unless things kinda... are really crazy and you know, yeah, you're yeah. going to like immediately have another patient after yes. you do your turnover. In which case then I will eat. Yes during my two hours. But generally, yeah, I like my mind to be like free and relaxed when I go eat lunch. So everything has to be like done and in order. And like, 
I yeah, don't want to eat lunch and be like, oh, I forgot. I'm still five hours behind on charting. I don't oh. work well. So I would rather catch oh, totally. up on all of those things and then be able to go and like, actually take a break. Yeah, totally. Another thing before we move on to the next question that I wanted to touch on that I forgot was, I think I kind of mentioned it, but uh, with C-sections. So some hospitals, what they'll do is if your patient, if she's laboring and she, it's deemed that she needs a C-section, you know, for X, Y, Z reason, um, our hospital where we work at, we will circulate and recover her and still take care of her during that period. But some um, hospitals, if your patient has a C-section, you like give report to another team, like an OR team basically, and they take your patient from there. Um, I, but our hospital doesn't do that. We just keep them, uh, like the whole time and then we recover them in the PACU. So that's just another thing that I wanted to add to that. But, but yeah, I think we kind of covered that question. So next one, uh, let's see, I'll ask this one. So what are, we kind of, we've kind of touched on this, so this one won't be super long, but what are all of the units that we work in and what is your favorite area to work in on L and D? Okay. So on our at our particular hospital you can be assigned to the floor which being assigned to the floor means that you probably have a patient that's in labor or who recently delivered um sometimes if we're really really busy you might have like an antepartum patient which we'll talk about in a second or you might have somebody that's on postpartum magnesium sulfate, if they've got preeclampsia. But generally, if you are on the floor, then you're taking care of somebody who's laboring. So that's one of the places you can work. The second place that you can be assigned to is in the operating room. Um, We try to take turns of who is in the operating room, A, to make sure that nobody gets burnt out of being in the OR. um, And then also so that everybody's getting their fair share of it and like keeping up their competencies and whatnot of working in the OR. So that's usually every three or four weeks that you would be assigned there. And if you're in the operating room, then you generally are taking the scheduled C-sections. And at our hospital, we do scheduled C-sections at 8 o'clock, 10 a.m., 12 p.m., and 2 p.m., so every two hours. Um, So there's that. And then you could also work in the antepartum unit. So our antepartum unit takes care of moms who are having some kind of complications with their pregnancy and needing to stay in the hospital for it. This can be something as simple as I got into a car accident last night and they want to watch me for 24 hours and continuously monitor my baby for 24 hours just to make sure that there were no issues with a car accident to, oh my gosh, my water broke when I was 26 weeks pregnant and we're not going to deliver you when you're 26 weeks pregnant. Instead, we're going to try and keep you pregnant yeah. until you're, <laughs> yeah, my sister is currently <laughs> experiencing this. Um, no. I know. But yeah, yeah, keeping you in the hospital until you're 34 or 35 weeks pregnant. So, so yeah, there's really big varying differences in like who we see on this antepartum unit. But generally, yes, that is for patients who need some level of monitoring during the pregnancy and we just don't feel comfortable with them being at home. In that particular setting, usually we're one to three with our patients. So me as a nurse, I have three patients that I'm taking care of. And the primary reason for that is because most of them are relatively stable. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's kind of more of like a med surge feel in in the antepartum unit. Um, and then there's also the obstetric emergency department that we have at our hospital. This might be called a triage area um, at a different hospital, but the obstetric emergency department is essentially where anybody who just comes into the hospital at ours, it's your, if you're 20 weeks pregnant or higher and having obstetric complaints, then you would come to the OBED is what we call it. Um, and yeah, this is where we hear about what's going on, like take a set of vital signs, um, try and figure out what's happening. So say you're at home in labor, you wouldn't just go directly to, you know, the labor and delivery floor. If you were in labor, you would make a stop through the obstetric emergency department to 
have your cervix checked and make sure that you're actually in labor. So it's kind of like this in-between first stop that that somebody would make if they're having any issues. Um, And then the last thing that some of us are, could be assigned to is in being in charge. Um, So there's maybe, I don't know, 20 of us on the floor that do charge on, I've been doing it for about a year now, a little over a year um, in labor and delivery. I I did it. it. Yeah. Lisa (laughs) doesn't do it. Um, And it was something that I did back in my med search days. So it kind of flowed easy for me to do it again in labor and delivery. Um, But yeah, that's the last thing that you can do. And usually in our hospital as a charge nurse, you don't take a patient. You are just there to handle any craziness that's happening. We help with staffing. We make the assignments out. Um, and then we're just like the eyes to kind of oversee everybody and step in whenever we need to for somebody that needs help. Um, so yeah, those are the the primary areas that you can work in. Um, and really how our hospital does it is a couple of the nurses make the assignments a week or two beforehand. So we usually know when we go in what we're doing on that particular day. I might not know all the depths of what I'm doing, but I would know, oh, I'm assigned to the OBED today. Um, or yeah, I'm assigned to the OR and I can kind of prepare myself mentally for that. Um, for me, my favorite place to work is in the OBED and I like being in charge. Um, the OBED is really, it can be really fast paced. Um, there can be a lot of, lot going on. You can be managing, you know, four patients at one given time that all have different things going on. You never know what's going to come into it. So it's got kind of this, you know, fast paced vibe, but also it can be like really relaxed because you just don't know. Um, So yeah, that's, I thrive for the most part in environments that are like pretty fast paced, more higher adrenaline. Um, So that's my favorite place to work in. And then, like I said, I like to be in charge also just because I like to, I like to be the runner and like help You're bossy people. No, I'm just and, I, yeah. <laughs> and I'm bossy. No. <laughs> Maybe a little bit. <laughs> That's okay. When you're a charge nurse, sometimes you got to be bossy. Uh, so yeah, no, like Tiffany said, I don't do charge. So I don't know anything about charge, but I would say uh, my favorite area used to be triage slash OBED. We used to call it triage, um, but I don't really work triage anymore because I'm casual. So They don't let me do the OBED anymore. Like when we switched over to the OBED, there was this special training that you had to get that they didn't, they didn't have casual nurses do. So I never got the training. So I don't get assigned over in the OBED anymore, but I used to work triage all the time. And I, that was, that was my favorite place to, I would say to work just because it reminded me the most of the emergency department, that setting. And just the fat, I like the fast pacedness of it. And I liked the skills, you know, you, you put in IVs more often. You're just like, I don't know. It's just, it's just fun. And you just, I like see a lot of different patients. I I don't know. It's just fun. Um, but yeah, now I kind of just work on the floor. (laughs) Like every single day when I come in, sometimes I'm assigned in the OR, uh, every once in a while, randomly, like if I'm working during the week, which that's another thing to add too. If, um, if you're working on the weekend or if you're working at night, if you have night shift, there's not an OR like role, or you could have a patient that eventually, you know, might, might go to the OR unscheduled, but you wouldn't be like assigned to the OR if you worked night shift or if you worked on the weekend, because there typically aren't scheduled cases, um, that you would need somebody, somebody there for. So, yeah, I would say. Probably my answer is used to be triage, but now since I work on the floor, that's the only place I'm at. So it's probably my favorite place. (laughs) What? (laughs) I said it's that's yeah, that has to be your favorite place. That's my that's my the only place that I'm that I work. I don't even really I don't even really get to uh, I don't really get assigned to in a part of really ever either. So it's like that's just. When, when I come in, I'm on the floor. <laughs> that's just oh, you're good I at am. that. You're good at that. Yeah, that's too, where, so. I mean, that's what I'm that's best at. So. Yeah, that's what you're best at. So, yeah. yeah okay. So. Well, let's talk about next. What do you like most about being a labor and delivery nurse? Yeah. So we're going to both answer this question. So it's tough because I feel like 
I've answered this question, I don't know how many times when I go into other people's podcasts, they always an- they always ask me this question. So I've said a couple different things, <laughs> but I would say probably what I like most about labor and delivery, like my favorite day is when I have a mom and she's like a first time mom and she's nervous or scared and she need she really like needs my help and being really supportive, whether or not she's trying to go without an epidural or she has an epidural. I just like the, I just like being needed (laughs) and like helping a mom get through that either first time birth. Uh, I, I just, I like that, that feeling of like, okay, I really, really supported this mom in her birth and we bonded over 12 hours and now she's had a baby. And, you know, I mean, I get emotional at like when she like when she pops her baby out. So that's, I don't know. I mean, that's kind of general, but that's what I like most about L&D is just being able to help all these different women. And that's my that's my favorite, I guess, type of patient. Like that, maybe that sounds bad, but that's my favorite type of patient to take care of. And that's probably why I do what I do because I like the education aspect of it. I like those first time moms that I can really like just wrap my arms around and just be like, it's going to be okay. Let me teach you everything I need to, everything you need to know, unless we're going to get through this together. <laughs> so that's my answer. <laughs> yeah. I would say mine is probably similar. Um, yeah you know, being a part of somebody's birth is such an honor. Um, You know, it's like the most intimate thing that you'll ever do in your whole entire life. And even those closest to you don't get to be in there, you know, like, I mean, sometimes they can, sometimes people will bring in 10 people into their delivery, but for a lot of people, it's just their partner. Not anymore, not with COVID. (laughs) I know now it's like really restricted, but yeah, yeah, they don't like, they don't even have their mom in the room a lot of the times. And it's just such a privilege um, to be there with new moms and couples and, you know, whoever as they're bringing life into this world. So that for sure, like in a big picture is my favorite part of it is just being in births and watching new life be born is really, really spectacular and incredible. Unlike a more, you know, I don't know, like nursing kind of thing of what my favorite thing about like an L and D nurse compared to something else is we do have a ton of variety, which is what we just talked about. Like no day is ever the same. Um, you know, the fact that we get to rotate through these different units is really awesome. And then also for me, I love how the unit like ebbs and flows. Um, you never know what's going to happen. So there are some crazy days where it's like so busy and we have 15 deliveries just, you know, from 7A to 7P. But then there's days where it's really, really slow. And, you know, I've had days where I don't have a single patient all day long. And, you know, like, that's one of the things about labor and delivery is we like to try and always keep a couple nurses free if we can. Um, just because like you said, you never know when somebody's going to come in and have a baby. So it, we always like to have some backup for a, just in case, you know, last minute induction or here, somebody comes in and is nine centimeters and having a baby. Um, so sometimes we'll come in and we, you know, we won't be assigned a patient. We'll come in and it's like, okay, Tiffany, you're free right now. And I'm just waiting for a patient to come for me. And in that time when I'm free, I'm helping the other nurses out or I'll go pop into the first scheduled OR case and help with that. You know, we're, we're usually not just sitting around and sometimes nobody needs any help and you are just kind of sitting around. Um, but yeah, I like that part of it is that sometimes it's crazy and sometimes it's not crazy. And like, we get to sit there and chit chat with our coworkers and Mm -hmm hang out and be goofy and stupid. It's, <laughs> it's very different than the area of nursing I was in beforehand because med surge, it was like, always go, 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 go. You never had time to sit down. There's always something you were doing And this. Sometimes it's like that, but sometimes it's really chill too. Yeah. And I was going to add on that too. I think it's, I think a big difference between working on a med surge unit and like working in labor and delivery is that your day is 
like fairly similar. If you work day shift on which you work, you worked day shift on med surge, right? When yep. you worked yep. in med surge. So like your day is very much the same routine. I mean, you're going to have different patients, but like you always, you know, do your uh, meds at 9am and 12, you know, it's like you do your pass your meds and then the te- doctors come around and talk about X, Y, Z and see your patient. And then you do a round of meds again. And then like something happens in the afternoon and then you do more meds. It's like, it's kind of, I don't predictable. know. Then, yeah. yeah. Predictable, predictable, but labor and delivery is very unpredictable. And I would say that's something that I, I like too about labor and delivery that it's like you just never know what's going to walk in that door, and sometimes mm-hmm. there's a lot of drama. I'm not I'm not gonna I'm not shy to say like I I kind of like the drama, yeah. <laughs> like I like the drama of the job. Um, that you just yeah you just never know, and we get yeah, a and lot of different like, kinds of patients. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's a maybe misperception that people have about labor and delivery. It's certainly yeah. probably something I had um, about it before I became a labor and delivery nurse is just that it is like really adrenaline filled sometimes. It is. I mean, yes. it's very life and death sometimes. Yes. Um, and like much more so than any, than like med surge for me. Oh, I yeah. mean, most of the patients are relatively stable, but this it's, it's way more um, packed with, you know, these like kind of crazy moments and like, and yeah, that it's really, truly emergent. Um, mm-hmm. And that's, what's cool about it too, is that, you know, it's not, I don't know. I don't know what my perception was of like a labor and delivery nurse, but I felt like people, I don't know. I thought people kind of thought that they weren't, I would hate to say like not true nurses or not real nurses, but it, it, I almost had this feeling that people talked down about them. Like they didn't like do a whole lot or something, or like, I swear somebody told me one time that like, Oh, a labor and delivery nurse, like, do they even know how to work up? IV pump, you know, like something like that. I just heard these like things from other nurses that made it seem like L and D was like, not, not, not yeah, Yeah. I know what you're saying. I know, I know what you're getting at. And it's so Um, not that it's so not. And I think, I think anybody who has come from a med surge or any other sort of floor will agree that labor and delivery is unlike any other specialty in the, like I'm not say, I'm not trying to say like we're the best kind of nurses that there ever you know like blah, blah 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 but it's like very very unique so like med surge is med surge and even like I don't know in the emergency department like could I pop up to a med surge unit and work and kind of know what I was doing if I was an ER nurse yeah generally could an ER nurse come up to labor and delivery and like take care of my laboring patient? Heck no. no. <laughs> right. It's just no. like a whole different set of skills. Could I go, we were just talking about this the other day with being on like COVID units. Could I go and take care of a patient in the ICU with all of those crazy drips and like all of the, no, heck no. <laughs> like that's not my no. yeah. skill set at all. So it's very, very unique in that sense as well. Um, but yeah, it's a very specialized field. Um, yeah. You know, like we, as a, as a new nurse, I did three months of orientation as a med surge nurse, three months as a brand new spanking nurse. Mm-hmm. And as a new labor and delivery nurse with experience as a nurse, I did three months of orientation. Yeah. So yeah, it's yeah. kind of crazy because the orientation was like the same amount of time. And I remember as a new grad- oh. Three months, I like at the end of a month and a half, I was so over orientation and I was like, I'm good. I'm fine. I can do this. I don't want to be on orientation anymore. But as a labor and delivery nurse on orientation, three months rolled around and I was like, no, 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 no. I need <laughs> yeah, you're so right. I'm not ready. I need a, <laughs> at least six more months. Like this is way too much. Um, and, and like, you, I didn't get it. I mean, and I was fine, but it was so much more anxiety invoking for me to yeah. come off of orientation as a labor and delivery nurse who had experience just because it's so incredibly specialized. And it's truly one of those things that like, you can't learn it all in three months. I mean, I'm 
five and a half, six, I mean, I don't even know, six years later as a labor and delivery nurse. And I still am learning something new every single day. And I remember, (laughs) yeah, that's something that our manager, I remember she told me like in our, I think in my interview or whatever with her, she was like, you have to commit to me at least a year. Like, please don't leave before a year. And she was like, because for most nurses, it takes a full year to feel confident, to feel like you're not going to throw up walking into the unit every single day. Um, And it didn't take that long for me. I would say it was like six months after I started and I felt pretty, pretty fine. Um, But yeah, for those six, for for six months, I felt like, what? I kind of wanted, like I had butterflies in my stomach every single day walking in because I just felt like such a fish out of water. I had no idea. Like, I just felt like I knew so little. Yeah. No, I, I, I can resonate with that. I, I, I agree. I mean, I felt the same way for sure for that whole, probably it was, I'll say it was longer than six months for me. It was probably that whole first year uh, in labor and delivery that I felt like that, that you just, you're just like unsure of yourself. Like you're like, yeah. okay, I'm, I, I, I feel like I know what I'm doing, but I'm just not like overly confident. And yeah, it's, it's a, it's an unsettling feeling, but yeah, after a while. And I remember uh, um, older nurses telling me this time and time again, like you'll get it. It just takes a while, but you'll get it. You know, you'll feel like you own the room and you know what's going on and you feel comfortable in your role. And eventually that did happen. They were right. Uh, The other nice thing about uh, at least where we work is when you're new like that, people are very, the the older experienced nurses are usually very uh, willing to answer questions. And there's just, I mean, I feel like there's just always somebody's brain you can kind of pick and people are very willing to help out and answer questions that you have. So, but yeah, I'm sure it's not like that everywhere, but I, I would say in general, you know, that's, yeah. that's an, another. I think one of the things that like I thought about labor and delivery nurses, that is kind of true about us, but like, <laughs> I think I know what you're you going to say. Them and like, I don't know. People think that they're like mean they're or like, like they're TCHs. Yeah. Like they're not nice. Um, (laughs) and I remember being really intimidated because like, I don't know, I kind of like had heard this stuff from other people that like labor and delivery nurses weren't the nicest people in the world. Um, and I like nice to our patients, but like not nice to our, to our like coworkers. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And that's like not, it's like not the case, but it kind of is the case. Like we're very, (laughs) um, we're very like territorial, especially yeah. over our patients. Like, yeah, I am incredibly territorial over my patients. I don't want just anybody walking in the room and like messing around with stuff. Yeah. If you are going to do that, I want to know about it. And like, you know, I just, we're very protective over our patients. And then the other thing is I would say like, yeah, they're not, we're not mean. We're just, I don't know. I think that a lot of us have like a little bit of a, we're like an onion and you have to really pull (laughs) away the layers to like get inside of us. And I know that I experienced that as a new labor and delivery nurse. Like my goal as a new L and D nurse was to just learn everything labor and delivery. I wasn't spending those first three or six months, like becoming BFF with, you know, the other, you know, nurse that's been working here for 20 years. I just, I kind of kept to myself. I didn't, talk a lot. I didn't like over exert myself or anything. I just, I focused on being coming the best labor and delivery nurse that I could and like, didn't worry about like the relationship side of things. I just, I didn't want to come on too strong. Um, and it took me like a, a year, I mean, probably a solid year, if not a little longer to like really start to peel away the layers of some of the other nurses that we work with. And Yeah, like it's it's not that they're mean. We're just like guarded. And I think that's true. I mean, not that all nurses that we work with are like that, but a lot of us are. And like, I don't know, we kind of want to I like to assess like a new nurse that's coming in. I like to just kind of watch her and like assess how she is and you know, kind of get my feel for things. I'm, I'm somebody 100% that like, it takes some time for like a new labor and delivery nurse that's coming in now 
for them, like they've got to peel my layers away 100% to like get <laughs> down to who I am. And Liesl, you're not like that at all because no. Liesl's the nicest person <laughs> in the world. And that's what we always say about Liesl. It's like, one, what's one thing you can describe okay, Liesl? And we're like, Liesl's the nicest person in the world. Um, so she's not like that, but a lot of us are like that. So I don't say that in like an intimidating way or be like afraid. No, there's nothing like, wrong. On to be an LED yeah. nurse, but it's really what drives the care for our patients too. I mean, it's just this like yeah. a, a protective yeah. nature that we have over everything in our lives. I mean, it's not even just like our patients or our own self. We're very protective over each other now too. I mean, the women that we work with, like we're all very, very protective yeah. over each other and we really watch out for each other and take care of each other. Yeah. Well, I, I love that. I don't think there's anything wrong with the way that you are versus the way that I am. No, um, no. But yeah, no, that's an interesting, interesting point to add. All right. So like, let's go on to the next one. So this one is just like, what do you like least about? And I think I started. So why don't you start and say, what do you like least about um, late room delivery? I think I'm probably going to say the same thing that you do. Yeah, I hate. We'll <laughs> okay, so I hate. Um, I hate the PACU. That's my okay. least favorite place in the whole entire world. That's not what I was going to say, but okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, I hate the PACU. Um, a lot of people hate the OR and like can't stand it, but I, I don't mind the OR. I would happily yeah. be in the OR all day long if I could just like hand my patient over to somebody else once they get into recovery. But I hate recovery just usually because it's like boring um, and you just have to sit there and for two hours and it's, it's just boring and you're all alone in the PACU. That's yeah. why I really don't like it. It's cause like, I can't even talk to somebody. If I had like another nurse back in the PACU with me, which mo- like sometimes you do have another one back there, but a lot of times you don't. So it's just boring. Um, so yeah, I don't like that. And then just like nursing in general, I don't like waking up early. Um, <laughs> yeah. and especially now being a mom and having kids, I don't love the 12 hour shifts because I pretty much don't get to see my kids on yeah. days that I work. So that's just like an overall nursing thing. It never, it never bothered me. Um, like when I didn't have kids working 12 hours and 12 hours goes by really, really, really fast. Yeah. Um, it's like, 12 hours goes by so, so fast. Um, but yeah, I'm, I miss seeing my kids and I hate that my kids, like they wake up around seven and they go to sleep at seven and those are the hours that were there. So I pretty yeah. much on days that I have to work, just have to like FaceTime them once yeah. or twice during the day and I don't get to see them. So that makes me sad. Yeah. No, well, that's good. That's funny. No, my, my answer is not, not pack you or, or that. I mean, I don't like, I don't like that aspect of it getting up early either, of course. Um, but no, my answer is uh, traumatic stuff. I, I hate like a super crazy emergent, like unscheduled C-section oh. where you're like running back. I don't want, that makes me very uncomfortable. Oh, see, <laughs> like, I it, like, like that. oh no, it like com- totally like flusters me. Like I'm like, and then I'm like all off for the rest of the day. If I have that happen or if like um, you have a, ba- a baby that comes out not looking so good and you have to do something like really immer- I just get flustered. I just get flustered. Do you think that that is more so now because you like are casual at the hospital and you only work at once every couple of That's weeks? Do you think it's worse now? That's interesting. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe that is why because I'm just not there as much. So because that is something that I don't like as a casual nurse now that I'm not there. Because I, I feel like sometimes when I come in like, oh, this policy changed from XYZ yeah, and now it's ABC. It. I feel like, yeah. okay, generally I, I've been here for six and a half years. I know like how to take, how to labor a patient. It's not like my competencies are like off. It's like, oh, we plug this into the OR instead of this. And yeah. I'm like, I'm not going to do, you know, it's like that feeling, you know, it's like, I'm, I'm going to do like something wrong because like, I just, I, I haven't been here. Yeah, it must yeah. be. It must be because I'm just casual and I'm just like not there as much. Um, yeah, but yeah, I that's, that that's definitely big, mine. Yeah. I bet you that has a big piece to it. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Which is understandable. Yeah. Yeah, totally. All right. Uh, why don't you, I'll read this last, this, we have two more, so I'll read this one and then you read the last one. So this, okay. this next one is any tips for new grads or experienced nurses who are interested in getting into labor and delivery? We've kind of talked about it a little bit thus far, but you want to yeah, give tips so, and I'll, I'll add to if you have, if, if you don't say, don't say them all. Okay. Um, so for a new grad, 
First, you have to find a hospital. If you want, if you're like 100%, I want to get into labor and delivery, you need to find a hospital that will actually hire you as a new grad. Um, Our hospital does. I think we're now like, I think twice a year we hire new grads, usually anywhere from one to three. Um, So find a hospital that will do that. Like don't waste your time on a hospital that's not going to do that. And our particular hospital has this like one year long program. That's like this nurse fellows program for all new grad nurses. That's really great. Um, So find that. Um, I would also say try and do your capstone or preceptorship in your final semester of nursing in yeah. labor and delivery, if you can. That's like so, so did important. Did you do that? No. When you were, no, I did it. I did my uh, preceptorship. No, they wouldn't let us. Delivery. Interesting. Yeah, they, like there was no option for that. So oh. I did mine in the medical ICU and oh, I hated it. Um, yeah, I'm sure but, you did. <laughs> not fun. Um, but so yeah, that's another piece. And then, yeah, for new grads, I would say, I don't know, some people will like message Liesl. I help Liesl answer some of her DMs that you guys send. And some people will message asking this same question. And some have asked like, should I try and get a year of experience somewhere else on like a med search for or go straight into labor and delivery? And like, I don't really think that there's like a wrong answer. I think you could do either or if yeah. you can secure a job in labor and delivery as a new grad, then like, dude, do it. Like, don't pass I that agree. up. I agree. You, if that's what you want to do. And you're like 100% like, I want to be a labor and delivery nurse, then go down all the avenues you can to try and get a job. Um, the, the orientation at our hospital for a new grad in labor and delivery is six months long. So it's double the length of Mm -hmm. somebody with experience. Um, But yeah, we work with a decent amount of nurses that came straight into labor and delivery out of nursing school and they're all fine. Like they're not lacking in any way, shape or form. Um, So yeah, I think that if you can do it, great. If not, then that's okay too. Um, And surely that, you know, year or two years or five years or 10 years, whatever it is, will serve you well also. Yeah. Um, so something I get, I see asked often too, is like, what I want to get into labor and delivery. How do I go about mm-hmm. doing that? Should mm-hmm. I get like certain certifications or do this or that? So my biggest pieces of, of advice for experienced nurses who want to make the hop into labor and delivery is one, there's really no extra certifications that you need to get. I sh- I wouldn't waste any time or money doing anything because yeah. you'll get everything that you need and then some on your orientation and like really within that first six months of you um, getting this job. So I wouldn't worry about that. Um, the biggest things that you can do are to network. So like utilize every single resource that you can. And if you can find somebody that works on the labor and delivery unit of, at the hospital that you want to work at, use them. Like don't be afraid to use them. Um, so network as much as you can. Another thing I would say is to try and get yourself up on that unit to shadow. Mm-hmm. That's really important to do. Um, different hospitals have like protocols for shadowing. I know at ours, we're currently not allowing people to shadow that aren't like in our hospital system already. Yeah. I think particularly just because like they want to make sure that you're up to date with your like tuberculosis test and like, you know, just kind of like policy kind of stuff. Um, But But they do let people shadow that are already nurses at our hospital because they already know that they've got all that stuff. So if you're working at the hospital, try and get yourself for even just a couple of hours to get up and shadow and like not, it's not like, don't utilize that experience just to like go in and watch babies being born, talk to the nurses, ask questions, ask about how their scheduling works and call and um, how involved is the unit, you know, just in like terms of committees and whatnot, like ask, try and dig into those questions. So that's a big one. And then the last thing I would say is get your name in front of that manager in some way, Uh, whether that be you calling her 
or you finding her email address and emailing her your resume, you know, in like, I got lucky that I just applied for a job and like on this job application and got called. But the process that an application has to go through to finally wind up in the manager's hands is lengthy. Like it's using like keywords and then it's got to go through HR and then HR pulls. You did it the hard way for sure. Yeah. Like it's not the easiest way to do it. So if you're interested, like find out what the manager's name is, get an email address and then start hitting them up and let them know you're super, super interested. Um, And yeah, like I said, we like beavers. Utilize all your resources. And then, um, like I said earlier, don't stress out too much. I think a lot of people, they want to know how their resume, like how can my Mm. resume look most impressive to get me this job? And yes, that's important. But for an experienced nurse, like your best bet for your resume looking good is to get involved on your current unit. Like, Mm -hmm. Join some committees, get involved in some system wide stuff, Um, you know, do charge if that's something you're comfortable in, be a mentor. Like, I think that that's 100% what set me apart as far as my application getting to my manager. It had nothing to do, I had nothing on there that was like, oh, some specialty, you know, certification thing or module or. CEUs I did regarding labor and delivery. I was very, very involved in in the unit that I was on. And I think those are the things that kind of set me apart. Yeah, no, I agree. The only thing I was going to add to is I remember one thing that they asked me in my interview was um, about advocacy, actually, and working with residents because we we currently work with residents at the hospital that we work at. And I, I don't even, I don't remember was it? I don't remember which one of them at, cause I had, it was all three of our supervisors in there in the interview, but yeah, one of them asked me about, do you have any experience or do you feel comfortable? Would you feel comfortable advocating for your patient? Like, and working alongside with residents because we, you know, you're going to work with residents. You might, a resident might say X, Y, Z, and you might have to go up the chain of command. Are you familiar with that process? Mm -hmm. Um, And at that point, at that point, I was like, "Uh, I've never worked with a resident before. No, I don't, you know, I don't know. But that is just, I guess some, I mean, there's not no way that you could really get experience with that. But that is something that is kind of important. Would you agree in our job is that you like certainly have to know how to, and that's probably why we're so guarded and protective of our patients because like we really have to hard advocate for our patients sometimes in certain situations, not to say anything bad about, you know, residents that we work with or even the OBs or, or anything, but there are sometimes certain situations that come up, um, that, yeah, we just kind of have to speak up and say, Hey, I know you said that you wanted to do this order, but like, this is actually going on. Do you actually think this is best practice? And they say, Oh yeah, you're right. Let's do this instead. So, yeah, for sure. I mean, I 100% have to speak my mind more as a labor and delivery nurse than I ever did as a med surge nurse. It's just, it's different. Um, And there's this confidence that you have to have. And I think that's what probably was so terrifying about coming off of orientation is like, you kind of, you have to have that confidence immediately. And this is something Lisa and I talk about a lot is like, fake it till you make it. But like, that is (laughs) so what we had to do. Like, you just had to exude this confidence that you knew what you were doing and you knew what you were talking about. Um, And especially like, you know, like we said, we work with a lot of residents. They you know, they might have spent a rotation in OB in, you know, during their school or whatever, but like, they're kind of hopping around and in their first year, and especially in those first couple of months, you know, they don't, they don't know exactly what they're doing either. I mean, they're just this fish out of water, just like we are. And it takes time for them to build up that confidence as well. And sometimes you do have to direct them and guide Mm -hmm. them and explain certain, oh, this is how you do this or kind of, subtly or question question stuff yeah or question yeah. certain things that they're doing and sometimes you have to do that at the bedside and it mm-hmm. just takes this level of like 
just needing to know how to do that. And it takes time. And yeah, advocacy is a huge, huge thing in labor and delivery. Um, you know, moms, it's like they're, they're in their most vulnerable point of life. And, yeah. and sometimes you just can't advocate for yourself. And that's what we're here for. Um, and then, yeah, it's, you know, as a labor and delivery nurse, you have to be really perceptive too. I mean, I think that's yeah. a big part of, of what we do is like, just, I can go in pretty quickly and assess the situation, see what's going on. What's the vibe of the room? What's the vibe of my patient? How are their families interacting with them? Yeah. Like who's in the room with them? You know, there's just a lot. And then I have to kind of change how I interact based on that. Um, yeah, so that's some, a good point. Some situations are just more heated than others or more drama filled or, you know, and some are just really relaxed and calm. And yeah, we kind of have to like go with the vibe that's bringing off the in the room. Yeah. And also like this, these birthing experiences are all about mom and her partner and what she wants. Um, mm -hmm. So we have to be like very mindful of giving our opinion without mm -hmm. giving our opinion you yeah. know, like it's really about trying to educate and not like suede you one way or the other. It's about like laying out the facts and then trying to help you guide and, and guide a decision and whatnot. Um, so yeah, it's kind of tricky. It's, it's just so much, so different than what I did previously. And I talked to, you know, we have a lot of friends that are nurses. I mean, like all of my friends are nurses. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and, I um, Lot and yeah, it's, are, yeah. it's really different. And I would say one thing about labor and delivery is you either love it or you hate it. Yes. Like you either love this and it's, it's everything and it's your life and you're just so passionate about it. And, and you never leave and you're there everything. for everything. Yeah. You're there 30 for years. Yeah. Yes. Or you like, or I have nurses that I'm like, Oh, I'm a labor and delivery nurse. And they're like, Bleh! and they yeah. like, they no, look thank like you. They get, yeah, they're like, yuck. I don't know why you would ever want to do that. Um, and yeah, so you either really, really, really love it or you're like, you have no interest in doing it at all. Yeah. And I think that that speaks to the, the nurses who come up and work with us too on the floor. So uh, there's, there's either nurses like us, we don't have 20 years of experience yet, but we're in it for the long haul. We're not going to go anywhere. Um, so you have that that set of nurses and then you have nurses who like thought they really liked labor and delivery but once they get to labor and delivery they're like this is not for me yeah. I'm gonna stay here for a year or two and then like bye bye <laughs> yeah which so, is fine too you know? yeah that's totally Every, fine sometimes you just gotta be in the moment and figure yep. it out for yourself but yep. I think that Liesl and I can both agree that we like found it you know I think yeah. Both, both yeah. of our stories are very similar. Like Liesl talks in her birth courses about how she used to watch the birth story on TLC. <laughs> yeah. And I did also like, did you <laughs> I remember? Yeah. I can remember my 12 year old self coming home from school. Yeah, and dude. TLC, a wedding story and a birth story <laughs> and just being completely engrossed and fascinated I in know. women's health. And it was just, it was so fascinating to me. So it's very cool. We to, found like, our, yeah, yeah, we found our it's niche. Very cool. Yeah. All right. Well, let's finish this up with just kind of a fun question. Okay. So two or three years ago, however long mommy labor nurse has been around, <laughs> how is that kind of going into now being a nurse and, you know, now you're this public figure essentially <laughs> and this influencer um, that all these people across, you know, the United States and the world know you as, how yeah. has that been? as far as your practice goes, and then kind of a follow up to that. Have you ever had a patient that recognizes you or follows you and like you've been able to be their nurse? Yeah. So first question, I would say, I would say I try to separate being on the hospital and like doing mommy labor nurse stuff as, as best I possibly can. Like i Generally, genuinely never really walk into work thinking like I'm going to be talking about all my mommy labor nurse stuff with my patients. Like I'm going there and I'm doing my job and 
I'm a labor and delivery nurse and then I come home and I'm mommy labor nurse. Like that's kind of how I've always seen it. Now, what it's evolved into is like I'll come into nurse and I'll be talk I'll come into work and I'll be talking with some of the other nurses about mommy labor nurse stuff or one of the other the other nurses will say, "Oh, I had a patient over the weekend who took one of your courses. She loved it, blah blah blah, you know, whatever." Um and that happened. I would say that happens fairly frequently. Um, But for people recognizing me, it's funny, I had a patient over the weekend uh, when I worked and that she was the first patient that I've had where I've walked into the room and she like actually knew who I was like and she followed me and like we started talking about it immediately. Any other interaction, I think, like unless I'm like not remembering right, but every other interaction, uh, it's been just patients that I've taken care of and they don't really know who I am and I don't really bring it up. Uh, it's, it's br- been brought up. Like I remember I I've brought, I've brought up mommy labor nurse kind of stuff afterwards, like after they've given birth, like I know I've said to patients like, Hey, um, you know, if you need any resources, like I do actually, I do have like this page, (laughs) like, hey, this is what I can offer you. Like if you want to stay in touch or like learn more about XYZ or postpartum or breastfeeding, like I have this podcast. If you, if you need, you know, need additional resources, you can DM me, blah, 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 blah. Um, But I'm really never like coming in saying that even if like, it's a chill kind of situation. Like I'm usually pretty separated. But yeah, it is funny though that the that that did just happen for the first time and it's been what now like 3 years that I've been doing my, uh, almost 3 years that I've been doing mommy labor nurse stuff and that that patient she she knew exactly who I was and she was like a little a uh, fan girl and like we just you know started talking immediately about it. So that was pretty cool. Um but yeah, I would say the majority of the time I don't I don't have patients that reckon, I mean more so now that we're wearing masks and goggles and like caps and like you just you don't recognize anybody at all <laughs> because of like covid um but yeah i would i would say it's more so i'll come in and s- uh, i'll be talking to one of the other nurses and they'll say oh hey i had a patient that followed you or she said something about your course and she like I just had a nurse the other day say I had the sweetest patient the other day she took your course she didn't get an epidural she did so good like I was she was like I was so impressed with like how she did she was like your course must be really good I was like oh well thanks you know it's always nice when you hear that um but yeah I would say that's that's always my goal is like never to go in and be like this is me this is who I am I, I just I just go in and I just do my job and then I come home. And we, if we happen to talk about mommy labor nurse stuff while we're there, so be it. But I like that. I I kind of like that. It's, it's almost like I'm casual now. So it's almost like I use a different part of my brain now, like working on the floor than doing mommy labor nurse stuff. And it's, and it's a nice like change. So I'll, I'll end it like that. (laughs) Yeah, I think that I've seen you like go in and say hi to a patient. That's You're like right. I've said yours. hi to another patient, to another I've person. Seen you do that. Another nurse um, yeah. And yeah, it's hard for me because like I'm very intimately connected to mommy labor nurse. Like yeah. you know, obviously I've been working for you for almost a year now and you know, I, I, I literally look at every single DM that comes in your inbox and I send your way what, you know, I think is important you need to see. And so sometimes it's hard for me because I like recognize names of people who I've like sent a message to or whatnot. Yeah. And like, or, or I've seen, you know, somebody, yeah, that messages you that I like knew or whatever, or know, or have seen come in and out of the hospital or, you know, I've, I've definitely had those situations and I'm like, dang it. Like, man, I like know who this person is, but I like, they don't know who I am. So I'm like, I can't go in and be like, Oh, 
Hey, the one that sent you this message about I, what it wasn't Liesl. It was me. Yeah, you know, and not that like Liesl never answers her answer. Yeah, no. But a lot of times, um, I see them and whatnot. So yeah, it's hard for me sometimes because I want to be like, oh, I know you, but I also like don't want to say that oh, that I know yeah. you. Yeah. Even though I think all of your followers know that you have help, and then I help yeah. you when it comes to that stuff. There, there's this part that I'm like, man, I, I like. I, I wish want to I take credit. credit. Yeah, and be like, <laughs> I was the one actually that sent you all of those great resources, and you know. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, no, and, I know. And what you I mean. definitely have had people like mention you because I, I probably broadcast you to my patients more than you broadcast yourself just because I can, you know, and there's, it's not like me boasting or any way. Like, I'm sure there's a degree where you feel like this, like my job is just this is you to be your labor and delivery nurse and nothing else beyond that. But I don't feel that way. Like I can, (laughs) I can lift you up. So I'll, I tell a lot of my patients about you and a lot of them already know and whatnot, which is really cool. Well, thanks. Yeah. I think, I think that's what a lot of the other nurses do too, is they talk about me, but like, I just don't, it it's odd for me to like go in and like talk about myself, I guess. Yeah. Um, but I will say too, experiences that I've had in the past, uh, I've like, ha- I have been DMing somebody back and forth and them being like, oh, hey, I'm like, there was a girl, she was like in triage uh, and it was like I was coming in for a shift and we were like DMing the night before or something and she was there and like we were DMing and then I came in, came and said, Hey, and then there was another situation kind of like that where we were DMing and I came in to work cause she was, it was like a scheduled induction or something like that. Uh, and I took care of her because like we were DMing, but last weekend was the first time where it was just like random. Like I just walked into the room and she like knew exactly who I was. So that was cool. Yeah, That's cool. That is cool. So, yeah. All right. Well, we've been talking now for, I don't know, hour and a half, something like that. I think this was a great episode um, for people to tune in, not just for, you know, nurses, but anybody who's kind of interested in L&D. I don't know. It's, it's kind of cool to listen to other special, even if you're not a nurse, you know, you're just interested in, in birth and labor and delivery. Um, so yeah, thank you, Tiffany, for joining me today. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for having me again. All right. So that is it for this episode of the Mommy Labor Nurse Podcast. You probably follow me on Instagram because that's probably where you came from. But if you don't, head over to Instagram and follow me at mommy.labornurse for more. That is certainly where I am most active. I also now have a separate Instagram for just this podcast. So I encourage you to follow my second account at mommylabornurse.podcast as well if you want podcast updates. Again, that is at mommylabornurse.podcast. As always, you guys know that I also have a website where I have tons of articles all about pregnancy, birth, breastfeeding, newborn stuff, and more at www.mommylabornurse.com. I want to hear more from you on how much you love this episode of the podcast or how you think I can improve. So leave me a comment on one of my pictures, send me a DM, or send me an email with all the love. All right, guys, I will see you same time, same place next week.